Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next Endgame video. In the previous set of videos, we talked about Pawn Endgames, and today is an exciting day because we are moving away from Pawn Endgames and toward uh, the next type of Endgame. We start adding material to the board, and the subject of the next two videos is going to be King and Knight versus King and Pawn Endgames. These are Endgames in which one side has a King, a Knight, and or Pawns, and the other side has only a King, and or pawns. So we are putting under the microscope the battle between the knight and the pawns. And the knight, of course, is notorious for being very, very bad at dealing with past pawns. And this is one of the reasons that this type of endgame is so important to study and understand whether you are the side that has the knight or the side that has the pawns. I think it occurs pretty frequently in my experience and unfortunately is given very scant coverage in chess literature. The Duretsky Endgame Manual, which is sort of the endgame Bible, uh, devotes something like two or three pages to this type of endgame, um, and the examples are pretty haphazardly selected. So there's a lot to know in these types of endgames, um, and I have done my best to select all of the important positions. I will break them down very carefully, and in the subsequent video, we are going to put your theoretical knowledge to use with a set of practical examples. It's actually a fascinating type of endgame, uh, that gives rise to some really entertaining endgame tactics. So there's really a lot to break down, a lot to get to. This is going to be a pretty wild video because we are going to go through a lot of examples. And so without further ado, let's jump in. I want to say a few words before we address our first position uh, about how this video is going to be structured. So the way that I've decided to do it is as follows. We will start with a set of theoretical positions that you have to know whether you're the side with the knight or the side of the pawn. In particular, we're going to talk about the scenario in which one side has a king and a pawn, the other side has a king and the knight, and the pawn has reached the seventh rank. So we will discuss how the behavior of the position changes depending on which file the pawn is on. Uh, and we will discuss every scenario. I'll tell you if it's, if it's winning or drawn, and we'll talk a little bit about how both sides should proceed. And this, I think, forms the backbone for all of these endgames because... Not only are these endgames important in their own right, but they also serve as kind of target positions. If you rewind the tape a little bit, a lot of king and knight versus king and pawn endgames, they ultimately end up reaching some form of this situation where one side has a pawn on the seventh and is trying to knock the knight off with the king. So I think this is a good jumping off point, and then the video will be further broken down into several segments. We'll talk about handling the knight and trying to win, situations in which you have the knight and are trying to draw against the pawns. Then we take the side of the pawns. We talk about situations where you defeat the knight with your pawns and then situations where you use uh, your pawns or even sometimes your bear king in order to pull off a draw. So once again, I'm expecting a long video, but as always, I'm going to try to proceed uh, with kind of a, a focus on really making everything clear and understandable. So get your favorite beverage, whether it's coffee or tea or, or something stronger, strap yourselves in and let's dive into some theoretical positions. So we start with a scenario in which one side has a corner pawn on the seventh rank. And it's important to understand at the outset that when I talk about the A pawn, the same thing applies also to the H pawn. The, the chessboard is symmetrical. So A and H pawns behave the same way. Obviously, G and B pawns behave the same way, the same with the bishop pawns, and the same with the center files. So we don't actually need to discuss seven different types of scenarios. In fact, as you will see, we only need to discuss three, uh, because in the context of knight versus pawn positions, uh, if you have a C pawn through an F pawn, the behavior of the position is exactly the same. Uh, so you don't need to look at it separately. <clears throat> okay, so in this scenario, why does a pawn that has reached A7? And the knight is stopping it from c7. Another final important clarification is that we are discussing scenarios where uh, the defending side's king is too far away from the pawn. Obviously, if the black king is on c6 or on b7 and is stopping the pawn itself, then everything I say is null and void because the presence of the knight is irrelevant. Uh, so that's why I put the king on h1 in this situation. But as we will see, even if the king is incredibly far away from the pawn, there is a defensive mechanism where you actually sacrifice your knight and try to bring your king in in time. But that is not possible here, as we will see. When you have a pawn on a7, the knight 
is the worst at stopping the corner pawn. So of all the pass pawns you can have, you actually want to have the corner pawn. And the reason is very simple. Knights are terrible at stopping pass pawns in general because of their limited range of mo mo motion, their awkward mobility, and the fact that they simply cannot multitask because they're a short range piece. You could have a bishop on g2, and it could be stopping the promotion square, and it could be doing a, you know, 10 million other things. Uh, but also, that bishop on g2 can move around from one side of the board to the other. So if you approach it with your king, it can scurry away like a cockroach back to a8. The knight can't do the same thing, and that's why this particular position is winning, and in most cases, winning for the side with the corner pawn. And the method is very simple. You simply approach the knight with your king very carefully, as we'll see. And what eventually happens is that the knight runs out of squares on which it can stop the pawn and ultimately gets trapped. So what you do is, first of all, you go king b3 or king t3, of course. You have to avoid getting four. So king c3 would be very sloppy on account of knight b5 check, and black picks up the pass pawn. So this is true of any situation where you're playing against the knight. You always have to keep tabs on the potential knight fork. So we start with king b3. We zigzag our way past the landmine. Black approaches with their own king, king to c4. You can also go king b4, that doesn't matter. King c5, and the king reaches c6 in time. It attacks the knight. The knight is only one available square on which it can stop the corner pawn. It has to go back to a8, and then of course you play king b7, trapping the knight. This is such a common scenario in these end games. The knight simply has no available squares. There's no real estate on the left side of the board. All black can try to do is walk back with the king. And what you should notice is that black actually ends up being only one tempo away from drawing the game. If black, if the king moved like a knight, then black would play king c7 here. We discussed that type of position in the pawn endgame video. Here, black is one tempo short, king c6, king b8, and white promotes the pawn. So in the scenario with the corner pawn on the seventh, you win the game provided that your opponent's king is too far away from itself stopping the passed pawn. So this is the best pawn to have when you are dealing with a knight. The A pawn and the H pawn is both a blessing and a curse. It really depends on the type of endgame. If it's king and pawn versus king, then normally having the corner pawn is the worst scenario here. You generally want to have a corner pawn because the knight doesn't have access to the left side of the board uh, that it can use to stop the pawn. Now we move on to the scenario with the B or the G pawn. And again, everything I say about the B pawn also applies, of course, to the G pawn, etc. Now here I have brought the white king a little bit closer uh, because you kind of get the point. The king will eventually reach this square. And this position is a draw. So shifting the pawn once one file to the right actually favors the knight. And the reason is as follows. White starts by trying to kick the knight away from its control over the b8 square, much like you do with the corner pawn. The knight has to hop back to b8. And this is the chief difference. After you play the move king c7, the knight still has one file that it can jump to and maintain its control over the promotion square. The knight can jump out to a6 with a check. And white can continue pursuing the knight, but it can never kick the knight away from its control over the square. You can go king b6. The knight goes back to b8. Obviously, if you go the other way, if you go king a7, then the knight can go either to c6 or to d7, and white has achieved nothing. And if you go to c7, then uh, the moves are repeated. You can go to c8. But in no circumstance can you kick the knight away forcibly from its control over the promotion square. So this position is a draw. Um, and one other important clarification, we'll uh, talk about that shortly after we complete this initial discussion, uh, the, the fact that white can continuously pursue the knight is a unique property of the knight pawn. You can continue attacking the knight uh, and continue repeating moves in this way. Now, what you will see when we shift the pawn one further square to the right, we're talking now about the bishop pawn, the center pawn, and th those pawns behave in exactly the same way. So everything I'm about to say about the C pawn uh, is also true uh, with respect to the D pawn, the E pawn, and of course the F pawn. Here's what happens. White's mechanism is always the same. You approach the knight. Again, the knight has to come back to C8. Here you go King D7. And black actually has an additional option on top of playing knight B6, which is much the same escape mechanisms that we saw with the knight pawn. Black can actually go knight uh, C8 to A7. 
And what's important about this is that white cannot continue pursuing the knight without losing a bunch of tempi. Of course, white can go king d6. First of all, black can forcibly remove the pawn from the board here. In order to avoid that, white has to take an even more circuitous route with king e6. This, in turn, this just makes no sense in the vast majority of situations because black can use those extra tempi uh, to, to, to do something productive like move his king back. So white can eventually get to the knight, but it takes you a bunch of tempi. And the hilarious thing is that black does the exact same thing on the other side. Knight e7 rather than knight d6 check. And white can repeat the process, but by this point it's too late. So this essentially forces white to promote the pawn. And if you have no other pawns on the board, then obviously this is still a draw. But you can add a pawn to the board, and then you will see the chief difference between the knight pawn and the bishop slash center pawn. So let's examine that scenario. Let's add a black pawn to the board and see how the situation changes. Here, I've added a g7 pawn to the board. Now, with white to move, using your newly acquired knowledge of how the knight and the pawn behaves in this situation, try to give an assessment of the position. Is white drawing or is black able to win? I'll, and you can pause the video for a second. So the answer is that this position is still a draw despite the presence of a pass pawn on g7. And the reason why is because the king is able to continuously pursue the knight back and forth. You go king b5, uh, knight b8. I should also mention that knight c7 check here, uh, this actually loses the game because you go king b6. The knight can give another check, but we'll talk about this a little bit later. The king has to sidestep all the potential forks, king c5 would allow the knight to drop back to c7. And you see this so often. You promote a queen, and then you get forked with knight a6. In the next video, uh, we'll, we'll really get into the weeds of these types of tactical ideas. But what you should know now is that white wins the game with king to c6. And whichever way the knight goes, the king follows it. Knight e7, king d7, knight b4, check king b5. And in both cases, black cannot stop the pass pawn. So that would be unwise. White, black has to go knight b8. White approaches the knight. Black starts pushing their pawn. And here's the rub. You go king c7. If black continues pushing, you take the knight, you step away, and you promote. That's still a draw. And if black plays knight a6, you go back to b6, and you know the drill. And you go backwards and forwards. Black essentially cannot buy a tempo. But now let's shift things one file over to the right. Exact same position, except now white has a bishop pawn. And again, the same thing would apply if white had, let's say, a d pawn or an e pawn. Here, black actually wins. Why? Because after you try to do the same thing, black uses the mechanism we just discussed. Black starts pushing their pawn. And whichever way you go, the knight goes either to a7 or, in the other case, to e7. And white isn't able to keep pursuing the knight. All that white can do is helplessly promote the pawn. Black takes it with the knight. King takes e8. And black, of course, promotes the g pawn. So in your mind, you should know that having the corner pawn is the best case scenario. Having the knight pawn is the second best. And then the quote unquote worst passed pawn to have is normally all of the files in the center C uh, through the F files. Now, there's one more important theoretical position to know. We're going to move the pawn back one square and talk about what happens when you have an A or an H pawn on the sixth rank. Now, if you have any other pawn on the sixth rank, such as a bishop's pawn, well, obviously that is a draw because it's still a draw with a pawn on the seventh rank. This type of position is important to know because it's super common and the behavior of the knight here is pretty unique. This is actually, contrary to a lot of people's intuition, is still a draw. Now, why is it a draw? It appears that you can easily take the knight away from its control over the h7 square by playing the move king g7. Okay, but the problem is that the knight can use well-timed checks and the idea of forking the pawn to nonetheless stay in the within the range of control of the h7 square. Watch how black does this. Black gives the check on e6. If you go to f7, the knight stops the pawn from g5. And the first important detail is that if you play king g6, black has to lose control over the h7 square, but he keeps it tactically. Knight back to e6. And do you see the point? If you play h7, black drops back to f8 and picks up the pawn of the knight. If you go king f6, the knight circles around and you simply cannot take away all of the knight's key squares of control. Knight f8, if king f7, knight h7, if king g7, knight g5, king g6, we again reach the scenario that we just talked about with knight e6. So whichever way the king goes here, the knight either has a check on g5 or it sits on e6 and prepares to fork the pawn 
or it moves back to f8, or finally it moves to h7. And this is the sort of thing you can play around with yourself to really develop a better understanding uh, of how it works. But what you should know now is that if you have an h pawn on the sixth rank, unless the knight is uh, improperly positioned, and we'll address that scenario separately, uh, the evaluation is a draw. The knight is able to stop a corner pawn if it is on the sixth rank, but not if it is on the seventh. So those are the important theoretical positions with one side having a king and a pawn and the other side having a king and the knight. Now let's move on to sort of the second part of the video where we first take the side of the pawn. And we talk about a couple of very important scenarios in which the side with the king and the pawn is able to win the game and is able to surmount uh, the dogged resistance of the knight. And the first important idea that I want to discuss is what I have referred to as the Chiron promotion. And the Chiron promotion is named after André Chiron, who was a French uh, study composer. He uh, actually is behind a lot of the ideas that we now take for granted in King Knight versus King Pawn Endgames. And yes, a white has a knight. This is Chiron's composition. He invented this idea, uh, I want to say around the 1920s or 30s, but he was composing a lot of knight endgame studies for really for dozens of years. This is definitely his most famous, and this is an idea which occurs very frequently in tournament practice. So not only is it really beautiful and unique, but it's also super important. We will see it make several appearances in the next video. The goal here is to win the game with the white pieces. That may sound absurd because the pawn, well, it's not only is it on the fifth rank, but it's, it's restrained by the knight. What on earth can we possibly do here? Once again, pause the video and try to solve this simple but really beautiful study. Okay, so hopefully, as you were able to find, the solution starts with the knight to g7 check, sacrificing the knight. If black doesn't take it, then you take black's knight, and you keep the pawn protected. Black has to take. Of course, next, you push the pawn. And... As we've already discussed, this would be an easy win if the knight moves. If the knight moves, then you play h7, and the knight has nowhere to move in order to then jump onto one of the two squares from which it can control the promotion square. For example, knight f5, h7, and it's easy to see that uh, the pawn promotes on the next move. Black can give a check, but it's, it's totally meaningless. Same goes for knight e6 and knight h5. But there seems to be an extenuating circumstance. Black's king is very close to the h pawn. And black can seemingly make the draw with king to f7. You have to take the knight, and then black takes the pawn back, and the game is over. It's a draw. And this is where Sharon's brilliance really shines. White plays the move h7, and look at this position carefully. Despite the proximity of black's king, this is such a nice optical illusion. You think there's no way the pawn can promote. Both of black's pieces are right next to it, and yet this really illustrates, like nothing else, the awkwardness of the knight when it comes to stopping particularly corner pass pawns. If the knight isn't on the right square, then it's totally helpless. On g7, it's on the worst square on the chessboard. It's right next to the pawn, but it can't stop the promotion square, and neither can the king, which is blocked by the knight and blocked by the pawn. On the next move, white makes a queen. Just, I would pause the video here. Just look at this position for a couple of seconds and make sure you're convinced that that pawn is able to promote. So this may seem like an outlandish, bizarre idea that only occurs in, you know, compositions, but no, it actually occurs pretty frequently in night endgames. And so this is the position I wanted to start with when it comes to winning the game uh, when, you've, when you're the side uh, that is playing against the knight. Okay, so the next scenario I want to talk about is one in which the king dominates the knight. And again, we're still talking about one side having a king and only one pawn, and the other side having a king, a knight, and no pawns. Uh, we're going to add some pawns for both sides as, as we go along. So it's important to understand that not only is it important where your pass pawn is located, but the positioning of the knight is also critical. There are situations when, you, when despite the, the relatively... Uh, far back nature of the pawn. The pawn here is only on h4. It seems that black has ample time to stop it with his knight. The situation changes because your king is uniquely positioned to dominate the knight's crucial squares. So what you do not want to do here with white is play the move h5. And you can use your knowledge to determine that if you play h5, which is hasty, black drops the knight back to e6. And guess what? 
After h6, knight f8 check, we get exactly the position that we discussed. The pawn is only on the sixth rank, and black is able to make the draw. You should know this by now. King g7, knight e6 check, etc. What you want to do instead in this position to win the game is take away the knight's key uh, retreating squares because without access to e6 and f5, the knight has no way to get into the zone where it will be able to stop the h pawn. So paradoxically, after king f6, white wins the game. White wins the game because the h pawn is simply free to promote and there is absolutely nothing the knight can do. And I won't give too many lines. Again, you are welcome to set this up and analyze yourself. I will give one very instructive line. The domination continues. Black can try a very devious idea. Black can go knight f3, white pushes h5, and black goes to h2, right? The knight is such a unique piece because this is the only thing it can do. It can actually go the other way in order to try to stop the pawn. And again, you should see why h6 is wrong. The knight steps back to g4, forking the king and the pawn, and black secures the drop. But part two of the domination is to step your king back to f5, once again taking away the knight's only good square, the g4 square, and finally, the pawn is able to promote. For instance, knight f1, h6, black can give a completely meaningless check on g3. So you play king to g6. And on the next move, uh, you play h7 and then h8. Knight e2, h7, black can give another meaningless check. And at this point, you can do many different things. The best uh, move to play is king f7. So notice here that the king and the knight are three squares away. And that is a very effective position to be in if you're the king because you're controlling the knight's two critical retreating squares e6 uh, and g6 so if we rewind back to the start this is an important situation to imprint in your memory you can kind of uh create a mental reference point in your mind where yeah the king is diagonally one square away from the knight but there are many situations in which the king is able to dominate the knight what i suggest is that you take away the key concept which is that you can use your king to take away, to deprive the knight of squares that it has to go to in order to stop a passed pawn. And the kind of corollary to that is that when you've got a passed pawn, uh, yes, your default is to push it, but sometimes investing that extra tempo uh, to prevent the knight from reaching important squares is the difference between a win and a loss. After king f6, white wins the game, and obviously black's king is way too far away. So let me check my notes here to see if I have any other positions I want to get to where the side with the pawns wins the game. Yes, there is one. And again, uh, we are going to start with a position in which one side does have a knight. So technically, this starts out as a knight end game, uh, but ultimately, it still demonstrates the superiority of passed pawns over the knight. So we are actually going to flip the board here because this comes from a real game. This comes from a real game. From the 1920s, it is black to play. And yes, again, we, we start with a knight end game. We start in a scenario where both sides have the knight, but you will quickly see what it is that I am trying to illustrate with this example. Now, not only are pass pawns incredibly strong when it comes to overwhelming the knight, when you've got two of them, when you've got connected passers uh, supported by a king, uh, that can overwhelm a rook. And the knight is often completely helpless when it comes to facing an army composed of a king that is supporting two pawns that are on adjacent files. And so if you kind of know that, then the winning idea in this position should be very, very easy to spot. It's black to play. See if you can pause the video and figure out a way to quickly and efficiently break down white's resistance. Okay, I've got, I've got several beverages here that I can help myself to as I think of all the people torturing themselves over this position. So what makes this a little bit trickier, I think, is the presence of the H2 pawn. This is kind of a red herring in the sense that I can kind of see a case being made for an idea that involves, um, for an idea, oh, sorry, it is uh, white to move, but that, that changes absolutely nothing. Um, in the game, white played knight c1. Everything that you thought about still applies. In fact, even more so. So I could see a case being made for king e5 and trying to go king f4 and king g3, etc. The problem is that the win here is a lot trickier to achieve. After knight b2, if you play king f4, white can step up with king g2, right? If white <clears throat> plays d6, then your idea works to perfection. You go king g3 and then you checkmate on f2. But white can go king g2, and you can't go any further. 
And if you go the other way, well, it's very easy to let the pawn forward to d6. And here, black is actually still winning, but things get a lot more complicated than they should be. In the game, black was able to find a much simpler method of winning. The first step is to bring your knight back to e5. And after knight b2, a very straightforward tactic wins the game. You sacrifice your knight for the c4 pawn. Then you take the pawn on c5. This h2 pawn is totally irrelevant. You would win the game without it in exactly the same way. And the pawns and the king totally overwhelm the knight. That is very easy to see. doesn't matter where the knight goes. You pre-move c4. And all the knight can do here is temporarily halt the progression. This is actually why having your king is really important. Notice that if black's king were, you know, somewhere on h8, the pawns are not able to see themselves through to promotion. So the knight can't actually blockade two, uh, or even in some rare situations, three pass pawns. But if they're supported by the king, then uh, seeing them through is very easy. You play king t4. Notice, again, the king dominates the knight. But that doesn't matter. The point is to play c3. And you can actually choose which pawn to promote, c2 or b2, on the next move. And you're going to make at least one and probably two queens. So uh, the, the operative concept here is uh, sacrificing, in many cases, your knight with the understanding that two pass pawns supported by the king, in most cases, are able to overwhelm the knight. Okay, now we move on to a set of positions in which you are the side that has the king and uh, the pawn, or pawns, and you are trying to make a draw against the knight. And first of all, we're going to discuss a scenario where all you have is a king. There are a couple of very important positions where you only have a king and you're facing a knight and a pawn, and it's actually still a draw. These are also theoretical positions uh, which are very important to know. And let us start with what I call the imprisoned king draw. And the imprisoned king draw is really one of my favorite uh, positions within the subset of endgames because if you don't know it, your intuition is screaming in one direction and yet the evaluation is screaming in the other. If you turn on the chess.com engine, by the way, it's giving plus five. That's a meaningless evaluation because this is a draw. And whether it is a draw or a win depends on which side is to move. Uh, we're taking black side here because black is the side trying to make a draw. White is going toward us. White's pawn is going forward. So the king is currently blocking the pawn. And with white to move, this position is a draw. Even though, yes, white has a knight on d5. Why is it a draw with white to move? And why is it a win with black to move? Well, it's actually pretty easy to understand. With white to play, he has to move the knight. The king has no squares. The moment the knight goes back, the king has access to the c7 square. And the crucial thing to remember is that a knight does not have the capacity to lose a tempo. You essentially cannot engineer the initial position with the other side to move. You can do that with a king via triangulation, a technique we saw in the pawn endgame video. You can do that with a bishop, right? If you had a bishop on h2, you could just play bishop g3. Essentially, the knight cannot stand in place while controlling the same square. The bishop can. It can move along a diagonal. And it's easy to see that no matter how hard you try, you're going to keep running into the scenario where you're controlling the c7 square, but you have to move your knight away from it. It doesn't matter. Knight b8. Of course, white can try knight c7. This is the only trick that you really can try if you're the side of the knight. Of course, don't take and allow the king back. Just keep going king c8, king c7. Even if you have two seconds on the clock, this is easy to draw because you can pre-move king c7 and king c8. Nothing that white can do about it. Now, obviously, if we rewind to our initial position, if it is black to play, then black is in Zugzwang. White controls c7. The king has to step away. And white's king goes uh, to b7 or b8, and white promotes the pawn. So another one of those super powerful theoretical positions that you can aim for as part of a larger defensive strategy. And again, we will come across this endgame in our next video. The second really cool type of draw involves a knight and a corner pawn on the seventh rank again. But this time, we essentially flip uh, the positioning of the kings. So let's examine this position in which white's king is no longer boxed in. White's pawn is still on the seventh rank. It's still going toward us, and it's protected by a knight. This position is a draw with either side to move, and it's a draw for much the same reason that uh, a bishop and a pawn, a corner pawn of the wrong promotion color is a draw. We'll talk about that in, in a subsequent video when we discuss bishop end games. It's because every time white tries to approach black's king, it's stalemate, and white has no other way to make progress, right? King b6 is stalemate. King a6 is stalemate. 
If white steps back, then black toggles between b7 and a8. The moment the knight moves, white loses the a7 pawn. Doesn't matter how white tries to approach black's king. If you try to go from the side, you're going to keep running into the same exact thing. This situation, same thing. King c7 or king c8, both of those moves result in stalemate. If the knight moves, black immediately captures the pawn. And as you know, king and knight versus king is a draw. No matter, you can't even hypothetically set up a checkmate. So the defending side here is able to make a draw. It doesn't matter whose move it is uh, because the side with the knight and the pawn are not able to make progress. That is why when we take uh, the side of the knight, we will discuss a scenario where you push the pawn back one file to a6. That is an endgame that a lot of people get wrong by pre uh, by hastily pushing the pawn to the 7th rank and then realizing, wait a second, I've got an extra knight and a pawn, and I can't win this. Okay. So let me see if I have any other uh, illustrations of using the pawn to draw. I think that's it, and I think we are going to now take the side of the knight. Yes. Um, no, one more. There is one more scenario that I wish to talk about, and this is a little bit more advanced, but no less important. This is a defensive mechanism that can allow you to save uh, some positions that look incredibly lost, and I'll show you some beautiful examples of this in action in the next position. Okay, so this concept doesn't refer only to one position. It refers to a type of position in which one side has a knight and a pawn, and the other side has only a pawn and a king. And yet it is still a draw that I refer to as the opposition draw because the side with the knight is essentially not able to get out of uh, the awkward construction and move the king to the right spot while keeping the pawn defended. So in this position, it is white to play. And you can see a similar thing to what we just saw where the knight is linked to the pawn. So the knight must remain on f4. White's goal would be to essentially push the black king to shoulder the black king out of g5 and it seems pretty elementary and a bygone conclusion that white can kind of go around with his king and maybe even sacrifice the knight in the end but ultimately get to the h6 pawn but watch what actually happens white starts with king f3 that's the only move which makes sense now the amazing thing here is that the move king f5 as natural as it seems actually loses the game you cannot lose contact and this is the key thing to remember you cannot lose contact with the h pawn the moment you do the knight moves on to a better spot. In this case, it moves back to h3, guarding the g5 square. And now white can essentially initiate the process of shouldering king g4. And whichever way the black king goes, white's king uh, gathers more territory, king f6, king f4, etc. And if black maintains the opposition, the prettiest and fastest way to win is actually the knight sack on g5, hg, h6. And if the king steps back, it's too late. The knight picks up the h pawn and... That, as you will see, is an easy win. As long as the H pawn, as long as your corner pawn is not on the seventh rank, uh, the side of the knight wins straightforwardly. So rewinding back to this position, I called it the opposition draw because the kings are initially in opposition, but you don't maintain your opposition uh, unless you can simultaneously maintain contact with the pawn. And we see that scenario here, king h4. Let's say that white tries king e3. Here, you can claim opposition and maintain contact with the pawn. King g4 does draw, but the prettiest draw is, and the most conceptual draw is king to g5, maintaining diagonal opposition from our pawn endgame video. And after king e4, you keep opposition with king g4. White is on the cusp of reaching the promised land on f6, but no, you step back to g5, and there is nothing that white can do. White moves the knight, you win the pawn. White steps back, you step back, you go ring around the rosy, the only trick that white has in the bag is king to e6. And this kind of idea does win some games where you sack the knight and distract the king and now go king f6. But do not be fooled by the appearance of this position. It is still a draw and black makes it by circling around with the king. King e4, king g6, and black is in time to reach not the h8 or g8 square, but that's not the only way to draw. You can draw by playing king f6. Another end game that we came across in the pawn endgame video. This is why I recommend that you watch the endgame videos in order because they build on each other as we add pieces. Remember that things do keep liquidating to pawn endgames. That is why you should start your endgame journey by really learning uh, the, the substrates and the key tenets of pawn endgames. That gives you the power uh, to really approach the other endgames uh, as a knowledgeable student of the endgame. This is a draw because you keep the white king uh, locked on the H file. So amazingly, this position is actually a draw 
with white to move. Now, if it is black to move, let me triangulate the white king. Uh, so that, uh, I'm not take these moves with a grain of salt. I'm just trying to get the same position so that chess.com allows me uh, to move to move black. So we want to do this. We want to do this, and we want to do this. With black to play, this position is lost, and you should already know why. It is because you have to lose contact with the h5 pawn. You have to go king f5, and again, white does this thing where he goes knight to h3, preventing king g5, and then white's king starts to claim territory, and ultimately, uh, the knight is able to circle around and win the h pawn, or black gets, uh, black gets shouldered in the event that black just goes back uh, you do what you do in a pawn end game, right? You shoulder the black king. Now, obviously, without the knight, this is a draw because king and h pawn versus king is always a draw. But with the knight on the board, uh, this is an elementary win. Um, so something to remember, in some situations, you can draw the game with only a king and a pawn by keeping the white king at bay and maintaining contact with your opponent's only remaining pawn. This doesn't only occur with a corner pawn, but in most cases uh, of practical play, this is where you see this type of draw, and we will see it again. So don't feel like you have to understand this 100%. I'm kind of giving you the conceptual substrates in this video, and in the next video, we take a look at uh, more complicated and actual practical applications of all of these endgames. Now, we take the side of the knight, and we discuss a couple of important positions in which the side that has the knight and or pawns uh, is able to win the game. We start with uh, one of my favorite theoretical positions. We flip the board again. Now we take white side, where the knight and the king are actually able to mate black's king. And this is a situation which only arises when one side has a corner pawn and then a king that is essentially locked out by that corner pawn. So you might say, well, isn't king and knight versus king always a draw? It is, but when you add this pawn to a3, this is actually a win for white. And white is able to forcibly checkmate the black king in one of the prettiest endgame mating constructions. This position is actually a composition from, I think, the 1600s. There was a guy named Salvio, an Italian, early Italian chess master. Alessandro Salvio wrote one of the earliest chess books, and he already discovered this type of endgame construction. Very impressive. Pause the video. Let's see if you can solve this Salvio study. It is white to play and mate in five moves. Okay. So the first step here, and there are two moves that achieve this, is to prevent the black king from escaping via b3. If it does, then white's winning. You can bid goodbye to your winning chances. So you start with the logical move, king c2. After king a1, you have to do what is called building a target position. I mentioned that word earlier in the video. Um, a target position is essentially the position that you ultimately want to reach. This allows you to guide your calculation in the right direction. If you just randomly shuffle the knight around, you're not just going to stumble on the right mating construction. So first, let's ask ourselves, under what circumstances will we be able to checkmate the Black King? What is the actual mating position? What do we need to get? Well, it, it's not hard to determine that you, what you need to do is force the Black Pawn to A2, and at that very moment... The knight has to be able to jump to the mating square, b3. And there are a couple of similar mating constructions. For instance, the white king could be on c1, and then the white knight could be on c2. But since the king is on c2, the most feasible mating construction uh, is the black pawn on a2 and the white knight on b3. Now, let's reverse engineer this. Well, what has to happen in order for black to be forced to push the pawn to a2? Where does white's knight have to be such that a... Black cannot play king a2, and b, black has to therefore play the move a2, and c, the knight has access to the b3 square. So find a square on the board that satisfies all three of those conditions. There's actually only one, and that square, ladies and gentlemen, is c1. You guide your knight towards c1, knight c5, king a2. If a2, then we get the position immediately. Now, you want to avoid knight to b3. That would be stalemate. A lot of people, they just forget about this. When the king is confined like this, you always have to make sure that you're leaving the king with squares. No, you go knight to d3, king to a1, and now the promised land is reached. Not knight b4, which only satisfies the first condition and allows black to play a2. You can't reach b3. You have to go specifically to c1. The king is cut off from a2. Black has to play pawn a2, and knight b3 is checkmate. And again, your reaction to this might be, well, that's pretty, but why do I have to know this? And you have to know this because it actually does occur in practical play. It also is a great illustration that just because you have one minor piece left, 
doesn't mean that you can't checkmate the opponent. Mate is possible in almost any position. You should be aware of that. And as we progress to rook end games and ultimately queen end games, a, a big component of our learning is going to be developing our antenna for sudden end game attacks, which are some of my favorite uh, combinations and mating attacks when you have only one piece or two pieces and they're able to combine miraculously to checkmate the king. Here you need a little bit of help, but remember that a situation where the king is locked in by its corner pawn isn't necessarily a draw. Yes, the knight has mating capability. Okay, let's move on and talk about uh, continuing to use the knight in order to win the game. I want to next discuss a very important construction that involves a knight and a passed pawn. When you have a knight and a passed pawn and you're facing a lone king, and of course, again, remember, this is purely theoretical. So when, when you're looking at this position, it's an important position to know in and of itself, but you could modify it a little bit and things would still remain the same. For instance, you could add a black pawn to g7 here. And as you will see, nothing will change because ultimately you can use the white king to stop the black pawn. Here we're talking about the conceptual component, uh, which is what I refer to as the ideal knight pawn formation. So what white is trying to do here is ensure that black is unable to capture white's last pawn, which would result in an immediate draw. And the question is, where do you want to keep your knight? The answer is very simple. In most cases, when you're trying to support a passed pawn, you want to keep your knight behind the passed pawn. You want to defend the pawn from behind so that when the knight is captured by the enemy king, your pawn is able to push forward uh, and the king is unable to stop it. So a big mistake here would be to say, hey, I'm defending the pawn. Let's bring our king in, king g2. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Black goes king b4. You can't move the knight. You have to move your king. Black is able to capture the knight and then come back for the pawn because the king is on the right side. So pause the video and figure out where the knight belongs so that when the king captures it, the b pawn is able to rush forward to promotion. Okay, so the answer is D2, and I have to give credit to Mark Dvoretsky. This is one of the instructive positions from his chapter on King Knight versus King Pawns. All white has to do is go Knight C4, King B4, and Knight D2. Just sear this construction into your mind. And the point is, after King C3, this is self-sufficient. You don't have to address it anymore. Now we can bring our king up, and the moment black captures the knight, the B pawn rushes forward, and black's king is obviously unable to stop it. And of course, black should shuffle back and forth, uh, but now white has all the time in the world to bring up the king and ultimately support this pawn to promotion. And, and most king, knight, pawn versus king positions are incredibly easy to win uh, with the services of your knight. That's why we talked about the corner pawn on the seventh scenario, which is a very rare exception. Now on that topic, we also should discuss the situation in which one side has a knight and a pawn, but that corner pawn is now on the sixth rank, right? So a draw uh, is reached if the pawn is on the seventh and it's defended by the knight. We talked about that a little bit earlier. What if you shift the pawn one square back? Well, first of all, what you do not want to do is stalemate the king with knight c6. Another very common thing that happens, especially in time pressure. The second thing you do not want to do is push the pawn prematurely up to a7. So an example of that would be king b6, king b8 and now a7 would be a grave error because after king to a8 there is no way to keep the pawn protected while avoiding stalemate and even if the knight was on c6 here it wouldn't matter because the king could step away yes but then you would reach the theoretical draw that we discussed a little bit earlier all you have to know about winning this position is that you have to position the knight in such a way that it cuts the king off from a8 and the best square to do that is the c7 square the win is achieved with knight to d5. It doesn't matter where the king goes. Again, not a7 with stalemate. Knight c7 check is simple. King b8. The square is under control. And now you can push the pawn to a7. So you need the support of both the king, which guards the pawn, and the knight, and the knight which deprives the, the enemy king of the a8 square. Then you promote to a queen. And what's actually good to know, if you're in severe time pressure, if you're in a time scramble, there is a checkmate in two moves from this position, which is very common because... You, you often get this exact type of position, which is queen e8 check and then queen to e6 with a very elegant checkmate. So this is good to know. If you've got one second left on your clock, you can pre-move all of these moves, starting with knight c7, and you can win the game. Now, again, the move order is pretty flexible. 
um, you can play knight d5, king c8, and you can do this in several ways. If it were black to move here, it would not matter. If it were black to move here, you could still play a7 check, force the king into the corner, and then checkmate it on c7. All that you have to remember is that the knight belongs on the c7 square in order to deprive the black king of the ability to shuffle between a8 and b8. White wins in elementary fashion. Okay, and finally, we move on to scenarios in which you use your knight in order to make a draw. You're facing uh, a bunch of bloodthirsty pawns. What are the important defensive techniques that you have to know? Well, the first one, and the, perhaps the most important one, is using checks in order to stop the pawn. And we start with an elementary illustration of this concept, and then we're going to take a look at one other example that has a little bit more meat on the bone because this is so important. Examine this position with white to move. Now, we've already talked about a bunch of these scenarios. The big question is whether the knight can stop that h-pawn before it reaches the second rank. And you might look at this and say, well, no, there isn't, right? You can start with knight f5, black plays h3, and then black pre-moves h2, and you lose. Knight g3, h2, and you already know how to win this. Black just approaches the knight and then locks it up on h1. But this is where the technique comes into play. The knight is a pretty tricky piece. It might be very bad at stopping past pawns, but it's got some tricks up its sleeve, and one of them is to deliver a well-timed check to the enemy king in order to bring itself to a more desirable position. And the knight can do that here with a check on e3 because of the awkward positioning of black's king. The knight is able to, circu uh, to circle over to g4 and stop the pawn in time. And again, as I said at the start, you can now see that a lot of these positions ultimately get into one of the theoretical positions we started with, uh, with or without other pawns and pieces. And so knowing the evaluation is very important, whether you're trying to win or trying to draw. Here, you, you achieve the draw. We talked about this already several times. The knight uh, is able to circle, circle around and keep the pawn at bay. So white draws by using a check to stop the pawn. Let's look at this idea in the wild. Let's add some pieces on the board. This is a real game uh, between two very strong players in the 1930s. And in this position, it is white to play. So let us flip the board because we are going to be defending from the black side. And I know that when I flip the board, it can it can take you a moment to adjust your eyes to where the pawns are going. But as I said in an earlier video, that is an important skill, right? You, you shouldn't just roll your eyes and say, well, now I don't know where the pawns are going. You should be able to orient yourself in any position pretty quickly. And it's good to get practice in that realm. So black, of course, is now going forward and white is going toward the eighth rank. So white comes up with a devious scheme. He plays the move knight f4. And we talked about a concept like this. You sacrifice your knight in order to pave the way for a passed pawn. In an earlier instantiation, we talked about sacking the knight for an opponent's pawns. Here you sack the knight in order to deflect the enemy knight from its control over a key square. Uh, an idea that we will come across in the next video as well. And black decides to do something ridiculous. Black actually takes the knight on f4. This looks like a grave mistake because white plays g7 and the pawn is now unstoppable. And what's important here is that although black has two passed pawns, which are far advanced, um, black doesn't seem to be able to promote them. Now, what's amazing uh, is that black has an alternative draw in this position, which is incredibly instructive, an alternative to the, the main draw that we are using to highlight this theme. And we are actually going to get to that draw a little bit later. So we will come back to this position and discuss the secondary draw. But first, let's see if you can find a way to apply the concept. Can you use a series of well-timed checks against White's King in order to navigate your knight to the proper spot and, and stop the G-pawn? Pause the video and see if you can figure it out. Okay, so... The first step is to push the pawn up to d3. This forces the white king to capture c3. Otherwise, of course, black promotes his own pawns. Now the king is on a vulnerable spot. It's on a checking spot. You go knight c5 check. And the knight is able to make it to e7 in time or f6. That works as well. But there's one more important thing to remember. White plays h5. And white threatens to overwhelm the knight with the connected passers. But as I had mentioned earlier, the knight is able to fight a pair of connected passers as long as the opposing side's king isn't able to support them. And here, black earns himself just enough time to generate drawing counterplay with the aid of this additional apon. White approaches 
with his king. Now, a, an instructive mistake would be to, to play knight f6 check. Oh, I've spotted a fork. Well, white has two pawns, so capturing one of them doesn't help. White promotes the other. No, black needs to get down to business on the other side, and black is actually just in time here. King back, king g6, you push a3, white pushes h6, and the pawn race results in a draw. The most clinical move here is actually to avoid a2, because after h7, white keeps the extra pawn on g7. This is still a draw, but there's no need uh for you know for these shenanigans you actually want to just take on h6 and after king takes h6 a2 g8 a1 black promotes at the same time and as you remember from the pawn race video you have to double check that there are no skewers that there are no pins there are none here the king and the queen are in good spots and black is able to secure the draw so the key thing to remember here uh is that and by the way king b3 is also a draw even though white promotes with check at the end of the line this is something we will get to in a later video. When you have a corner pawn on the second rank uh, against a queen, that is still a theoretical draw, but it's unnecessary. Um, but the, the key part of this example is how black actually uses two checks, the first one with the pawn, but the second one with the knight, to navigate his way towards stopping the pawn. This is a game-changing defensive technique that you have to remember because it allows you to save so many positions that otherwise uh, you would have had to allow the pawn to promote. Now, we will talk about the alternate draw here in just a moment. First, uh, I want to expose the overall technique, and then we will come back to this position. The technique is what I refer to, as we flip the board one more time here, as using the knight and pawn in order to draw against the enemy queen. So this is a situation in which you have a king, a knight, and either a pawn or several pawns. And unfortunately, the knight is unable to stop the enemy passer. And the second unfortunate thing is that it seems that you are unable to use your own passed pawns uh, to promote to your own queen in time. Now, as you can see here, the knight is essentially on the worst possible square uh, where it, it simply cannot stop the a4 pawn from progressing to a queen. So the first thing to point out is that it doesn't matter where you move your knight. You can play knight d7, black plays a3, and you're not even close. Like you just can't reach the a, the a pawn, knight e5, a2. Uh, and black promotes on the next move. Knight c5 check, you take it. Uh, but by the way, even if there was no pawn on b6, using the technique of dominating the knight with the king, uh, you should be able to come up with the move king to c4, cutting off the knight from the key b3 square, then you play a2. But there is a pawn on b6, and that's unnecessary. So why is unable to stop the pawn? That much is clear. But you may find a sliver of hope in the fact that you have your own passed pawn on d4. Okay, so... That pawn can be pushed, and white did push it in the game, d5. The problem is that it's not fast enough. And in the pawn race, the king is in the checking zone, to borrow a term from the pawn race video, of black's newly minted queen. Darn it, black promotes with check. And most importantly, uh, wherever the king goes, the, the queen is able to contain the pawn, and in some cases actually even win the knight. For example, king e7, queen e5 check. Black picks up the knight and simultaneously stops the pawn from promotion. King e6 is a little bit trickier, but what black does here is essentially zigzags his queen. Check, queen d2. This is kind of the staircase mechanism that you have to remember, and ultimately you reach a situation in which white has to play king f7 or king d6, and in either case, black is able to pick up the knight. And after king e7, what you should notice is that queen takes b8 immediately would be a mistake because white can still promote and make a draw. Black should give this additional check on e5. This is the power of the queen. Tossing the king away from the promotion square, then you take the knight and you win the game in elementary fashion. But what's amazing is that white can actually draw. And white can draw with what may seem like an incredibly counterintuitive idea. You have to hold yourself back from further progress of the d-pawn and burn a tempo on positioning your knight on a square that it from which it will be able to support the pawn once it reaches d7. So the shocking move that white finds in the game is knight b8 to c6. Are you trying to stop the a pawn? Not at all. Here's what you're trying to do. And it even takes the engine a couple of moments to realize the brilliance of the scheme. Black plays a2. Now you throw in another check on d4. And the point is that if the king goes back to c2, c4, white's knight moves to c2. And after king takes d5, you fork the pawn and win, and white wins the game because white still has pawns on the king side. So that's not good. And if black goes back to c3, the knight buries itself on a1, 
And then white is able to promote the pawn just in time, and white is in very good shape. Still a draw, but this time black is on the defensive side. Okay, so as we rewind to this position, the king, of course, has to go to b2. And only now does white push the pawn. If the king, by the way, goes to a3, uh, then white moves up to f7. And look at this position. Remember it. Forks, forks galore. A1 queen, knight c2 picks up the queen. And white wins. So black actually has to go to b2 to prevent all the knight forks. Again, it's that diagonal situation where the king is one square away from the knight diagonally. But now white pushes the pawn. And after a1, queen, d7, you can see why you force the king to b2. The knight is untouchable. White threatens to promote. And this is the main theoretical concept. Why did we go through all of the trouble to get the knight back around to d4? Remember that we had a similar position with the knight on b8. But b8 is a terrible square. The knight is vulnerable on that square. The only way for black to stop the pawn is queen to a8. And here, you can dive into e6 with your knight, reaching a very important defensive construction. Even though black is a queen up, the combined force of the knight, the king, and the pawn allow white to draw because black simply cannot make progress. Black cannot stop the pawn or win the knight. All black can do is continuously check the white king ad nauseum uh, and, and make a draw. Queen takes f3, uh, king e5. Queen, king e7, by the way, is a mistake because if queen takes h3, this is a cool detail. White promotes, but black trades the queens. And you can see how complicated these endgames can get. And trousers, which we talked about in pawn endgame videos, are especially bad because the knight can only control one pass pawn at the same time. So it's easy to see that this is winning for black. White has to be incredibly careful, but this is less important. What's more important is the general concept of using the knight in the pass pawn to keep the queen at bay. And ultimately, black can continue to check, but black is never going to be able uh, to prevent the pawn from promoting. And if black tries the same technique here, white is able to draw because the white king is... Actually, no, king c6 is wrong because black trades and plays h4. You need to go the other way. And you assign jobs here. You say, well, king, I want you to stop the corner pawn. Knight, I want you to stop the b pawn. b5, knight c6, h4, king f4. Both pieces are able to fulfill their tasks. Uh, and white is able to eke out a draw. So a really important technique, a more advanced technique. So just because your opponent is promoting doesn't mean you should panic. As a last resort, you can drive your pawn up to the seventh or sometimes even the sixth rank. And because of the power of the knight to control certain key squares, you're able to achieve what's called a positional draw. A positional draw is a situation in which it's not stalemate. It's a situation in which one side is essentially unable to make progress. Okay, now as our final example, let's come back to the position that we had just analyzed, uh, where you use checks to stop the pawn. After knight f4, let's flip the board so we're facing black. Knight takes f4, g7. There is an alternative draw. Let's see if you can use your newfound knowledge and find that alternative draw. Remember that the draw we talked about first was to use checks in order to stop the pawn. All right, I'll give you a second to think here. Okay, so the answer is actually the paradoxical king to b4. And after g8, queen, d3, you would be forgiven for thinking that black can promote a pawn by force, but no, he cannot. King c1 would be a grave error. This would allow black to give a check on e2 and promote the c pawn, but white can step back to b1. And hey, if you play c2 check, white plays king b2, and black loses. Black can't promote the pawn, and yet this is still a draw. It's a draw after a 92 because white, again, simply cannot make progress. White cannot pick off the c-pawn by force because it's protected by d3. And all that white can do is helplessly deliver a bunch of checks. Queen b8 check, queen c7 check. It doesn't matter actually where you even go with your king. You can go anywhere. King c4, e4, e3. doesn't matter. White just has to keep checking. And there's no way for white to make progress. Even king f3. The knight and the pawn are self-sufficient. The only thing you can do to lose is play king g3 and give up the d3 pawn with check. As long as you avoid that, white can make zero progress in this position. So this is our final defensive technique in terms of using the knight. Actually, there is one more. I forgot there is one more position I want to get to. But the concept here is using the knight and the pawn to keep the opponent's queen at bay. Okay, the final position that I want to talk about here... And let me see if I actually put it in. Using checks to stop the pawn. Corner pawn on the sixth win. 
corner pawn on the seventh draw. No, it's not this one. I might have forgotten uh, to, to put this in. Corner pawn draw. Yes, no, I did not forget to put it in. It's this one. And this is going to be our final position and our final defensive technique uh, with the side that has the knight. Video has been going an hour, so thank you if you're still with me. Okay, final position. I promise. It is white to play here. And this might seem to be exactly the same position that we started our exploration with. We started, remember, by discussing what happens when the pawn reaches the seventh rank. And you might say, well, now I know that this is a win for white. White approaches the knight, reaches c6, and then traps the knight on a8. But as a last resort, there is one defensive technique that is easy to forget about. And the concept is you actually move the knight to a8. And you can even do it here. You move the knight into the corner. And if your king is close enough, then you can dash your king toward the side with the pawn and lock your opponent's king in the corner. In the position we examined initially, the black king was on h1. And I tease this by saying that the black king is one tempo short. Here, the king starts out on g2. So watch what happens. Black goes king f3. Black goes king e4, king e5. And the rub is that black is in time to reach the c7 square and stalemate the white king on a8. So this is a very simple idea to follow, but it's easy to forget about in the heat of the moment. Not only are you able to draw if your king is physically able to eliminate the pawn, but there is one silver lining to your opponent having the corner pawn, and that is that if the king captures the knight, it is locked in by its own pawn, and you are able to use the king in some circumstances to stalemate the white king. So those are our defensive techniques when you have the knight. And that concludes my whirlwind presentation of the key theoretical positions you have to know uh, in King Knight versus King Pawn Endgames. Let's do a very, very quick summary um, before we close off. And again, there will be a follow-up video in which we look at a bunch of practical examples. So right now, yeah, you should be feeling like, you know, I get the concepts, but I, I want to see some examples. I, I want to see actual positions with a knight and a lot of pawns against a lot of pawns, right? We mostly focused on one side having one pawn or no pawns. But again, bear with me. These theoretical foundations are going to help you tremendously. And without them, it's impossible to orient yourself in the more complicated positions. So first, we examined every situation in which the pawn reaches the seventh rank. It's generally a win with a corner pawn as long as the king is far enough away. With the knight pawn as well as the other pawns, it's always a draw. But the key thing about having a knight pawn uh, is that the king can continuously pursue the knight and essentially force a draw. With the bishop pawn and the center pawns, you can't do that. We then examine situations in which the side of the pawn is able, to, or the pawns, is able to overwhelm the knight. We talked about the share on promotion. We talked about the king dominating the knight, even if the pass pawn is rather far away. And then we talked about sacrificing the knight in order to win the game, where two pass pawns overwhelm the knight. Then we talked about a bunch of drawing scenarios if you are the side with the king and or pawns. We talked about the theoretical draw in which the pawn is in the corner. White cannot make progress. We talked about the imprisoned king draw uh, in which white also cannot make progress because the knight cannot lose a tempo. Uh, and we also talked about the opposition draw in which, again, white cannot make progress. The key here is to maintain contact with the pawn. Then we transition to... Uh, uh, to having the knight and using the knight to win. We talked about the Salvio study in which you can actually checkmate. Uh, you can actually checkmate the black king with only a bare knight. Let me find it here. Uh, sacrificing knight to win. Knight makes corner pawn. This is the Salvio study. Very common concept in practical play as well. Uh, we talked about the ideal knight pawn formation, which you want to keep the knight behind the passed pawn so that if the king captures it, uh, so that if the king captures it, you are able to promote the pawn. Then we talked about drawing mechanisms when you are the side with the knight. Um, we talked about using checks to stop the pawn. Sometimes you can't stop the pawn directly, but you can use a well-timed check against the king. This was our other example. And then we talked about um, we talked about using the knight plus pawn to fight the opponent's queen, and that can still be a draw if your pass pawn is sufficiently far advanced. Uh, the final thing I forgot to mention uh, is the scenario where the corner pawn is on the sixth rank, which is still paradoxically a draw because the knight is able to use the concept of the fork to keep the pawn uh, at bay once it reaches 
the seventh rank. And then we ended with that position where you're able to sack your knight and bring your king in order to lock your opponent's king in the corner in time. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what I have for you today. This was over an hour. I know that was a long time, but I really wanted to get through all of those key theoretical positions. This doesn't come close to covering it. There are a lot of other important positions that I omitted, and these endgame videos are not totally exhaustive. But in the next video, we are going to not only recap some of these important theoretical substrates, but through the lens of what I really feel like are some beautiful practical examples that I've uncovered and that are very much unknown, you are going to get a finer understanding for how to handle both the knight and the pawns, and we are going to talk about a bunch of more advanced techniques. Well, thank you for listening, everybody. I know these endgame videos are pretty dense, but it's really a pleasure to make them, um, and I want to make this the premier resource for endgame learning for players of all levels. Hopefully, uh, I'm doing a halfway decent job so far. On that note, I will see you in the next video. I will get to work preparing examples, and whether you're the side of the knight or the side with the pawn, good luck in your endgame journey. I will see you in the next video. Thank you for watching.